Okay, reading here in Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, the him there being the father, I assume, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So this talking about Jesus of Nazareth and saying that he was not of a visually pleasing physical appearance. And that may seem trivial to some of you listening, but in fact, a lot of people, including myself, including all people really, do in fact judge by visual appearance. Now we, those of us who would think to be something better would like to think that we don't still judge by these superficial means, but we do. And there's a reason God is telling us and a purpose behind why Jesus Christ was not a physically beautiful man. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So, even though this is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the people of that time, if, if this person were to appear before us now, we would look at them, him and just say, you know, this is just some ordinary guy, you know, or this is, this is some guy we really don't like, you know, he's not very handsome, uh, and, uh, you know, look, he's in trouble with the authorities, so he must be some kind of loser, and, you know, we don't really want to bother with him. You know, that is what Jesus Christ faced in his day. And by the way, one of the things that we tend to think is that our time is so much different. You know, now we have it's completely different. It's really not as, as, uh, as much of a difference as you think. I mean, people tend to be people. If you look at what the scripture is saying, you see that people are people back then, now, but not in the future as we see Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. So again, we, can sit, we saw him being afflicted by all of these people coming out against him when, we, when the people saw that he was being attacked by the authorities, he was being imprisoned, he was being questioned. Uh, they were uh, putting a crown of thorns on his head. They were spitting on him. When we saw that, we didn't think think much of this fellow. We were like, well, this is this. See, this is that's what you get for doing something wrong. That's the same attitude I've encountered in, in my life personally. But I can see that that's exactly what Lord Jesus experienced. But then God goes on to tell us the truth of what he did with his life and what his purpose was. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Okay, before I move on, because this is, is an, in addition to, the, to his death, we were healed by the fact that because we didn't esteem him, because we saw that he was somebody that was smitten and rejected of man, we should reject him too, we should hide our faces from him, we don't want to see this guy. But because that happened, and because he was finally brought to the authorities, and then abused physically, through these injuries that he sustained, God is telling us, that these were the payment for our transgressions our, the, and iniquities are the, the evil sins that we did with our lives, the works, iniquities, works of wickedness, these, these occupations that we did for money. These injuries, these 
things that would, would have come upon us were there no payment were cast on him. So he was punished in place of us. That was part of the sacrifice, not just his death. The chastisement of peace was upon him, being the next line in that verse. And, and that's telling us that the punishment that would have come to us were there no sacrifice for our sins through Jesus were laid on him. The chastisement, the punishment of our peace with God was upon him. So that punishment was on him. Our sin was punished, but it was punished on him. And with his stripes, that is uh, whips that cause a stripe on the body, with his stripes we are healed. Healed. The healed ties into what I was saying about the, the new flesh, the, the flesh that is fairer than the children of men, the flesh that is the, when you see this, that is Jerusalem coming, the bones flourishing like an herb. This is the renewal, the refreshing. His stripes are what allows us to receive that flourishing of the bones, that body that is fairer than the children of men, the reward for all this that the people have gone through and that God has suffered with us through. All we like sheep have gone astray, 53.6 says Isaiah. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Us all. Notice the all, meaning that his suffering, his wounds, his bruises, his ch the chastisement that came upon him, the stripes, were the punishment of us all but it was laid on him instead. This is why his death on the cross was the payment for us. This was the, the sacrifice for us. He, Jesus, who was without sin, he was the lamb that was without blemish, that is, without sin. The scripture says, for sin causes us to die. Sin causes us to descend into hell. We are all born in sin. But the scripture says that Jesus, his glory was greater above all men exactly because he didn't have sin, whereas we all, all of us who were not the Son of God, had sin and therefore needed to be paid because even though we did everything we could as a Christian or as a Jew trying to obey God's law, the scripture tells us very clearly that no man was able to do it. No man was able to complete the law completely. No man was able to be without sin. And then a big mistake a lot of Christians make is that once you are aware of this, then you are sin free, then you are forgiven. No. Because the story of the, the woman caught in adultery and then brought before Jesus by the Jews saying, look, we caught this woman in the, in the, right in the middle of adultery. So what does the scripture say about what we should do? It says we should stone her, right? This is what we should do, Master, right? We should stone her, actually throw stones at somebody until they die. That's a pretty nasty way to go. And then Jesus takes a while. He thinks about it because he didn't have the answer right away. But then it came to him. He knew what to say. And he was perfect in his answer. And he rose and he said, Let he who is without sin among you cast the first stone. This tells us that no man is without sin even perpetually. 
Because if you say, well, when I became a Christian or, you know, I repented and, and I received my baptism and now I'm clean. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Telling us that all have sin and then the story of the woman caught in adultery and then the people saying, well, we should stone her right now. Shouldn't we, Master? And then he answers and says, let he who is without sin among you be worthy to judge and cast stones at her. But all, one by one, walked away because they all knew, being convicted of their conscience, that they had sin. Thus, we understand that what's happening is everyone has sinned continually, even though this is a shame, even for someone like me to get up here and talk to everybody and say, look, I'm pointing out the problem of sin but I have sin, so I'm a hypocrite. But that is the dichotomy, that is the situation that we find ourselves in. That if we talk about sin, or we talk about the problem of sin, we must also include that we ourselves have sin. And to me, someone who is talking about this, whether they're a pastor, preacher, book writer, whatever, and you don't hear a, at least an acknowledgement that they have themselves sinned. I just wouldn't look to that source because they're not looking carefully. They're not able to admit. Their pride is such that maybe they have a problem taking donations to make the payments on their church. If they were to get up there and say, yeah, I have sinned too. And say, well, what's your sin, Pastor? Well... The scripture tells us that we don't necessarily have to share that with everybody because that sin is between that person and the Lord. But I think that it is worth talking about. I think it is something worth mentioning. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. So throughout all this, he kept silent. He didn't scream at the people who were doing this to him, you bastards, you're all going to go to hell, or something along those lines, or admonish the people that used to be around him that suddenly bailed, as we know, when things got hot. Because it says that Judas betrayed him, but all the apostles did. They all fled. When all this came upon him, when Judas brought the elders to take him, they all bailed. I mean, is that how you would treat your king? Do you run off? So the fact of the matter is that while they went on to become saints and martyrs and obviously the founders of the early Christian church, the fact is that in the moment of peril, at the moment of proving, what did they do? They bailed. Did they, did they take the sword and fight off those people? Nope. They ran and they carried Jesus away. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. Notice, my people, this is God the Father saying, for that Jesus, his son, was taken out of the land of the living. He was killed so that God's people, his people, Jehovah's people, could be saved because their transgressions needed to be paid through this sacrifice. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. You see, he didn't have the kind of mouths that we do. 
that are full of deceit, that are full of bribes, that are full of lies. Yes, all of us. You think that you're so clean, but you're not. We all of us have filthiness. We all of us have spots in our garments. And notice that although he was punished, he was given stripes. Imagine how bad it hurts to be whipped so that it leaves a stripe on your body that opens up with blood. That hurts quite a bit. I mean, and then imagine hanging from nails driven through your feet and your hands. It's quite, it's painful unto not being able to stand it hardly. But you don't hear him that he was screaming or cursing or threatening. He kept his mouth shut during it all because he read in the scripture and God had informed him through the scripture of what he was to do with his life and what it meant. And he understood all of this probably much better than any of us now reading can possibly hope to understand. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Here is where God is telling us. This is the information. It's, it's rather, I wouldn't say vague, it's, it's cryptic. It's put in a way that if you want to understand God, you really have to look carefully. You have to think about it. You have to add reality of the moment to what is being written here that sounds in it, it that the language is different the way it's presented is different because this is not how humans speak to each other you know the way you know I speak to people I, I'd be like you know okay look here's how it is and I'm gonna explain every little detail of it but this is it's like one sentence one phrase offers this tremendous amount of information and it's up to us to look at it and realize what it's saying it says when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, telling us that the death of his soul is acting as a sacrifice, a payment for sin that was similar to the sacrifices that God asked the older time Jews to perform so as to make a payment for the sins of the people. And this was the method that God used to show that it was a system of payment. We don't understand, I don't understand, exactly how, for instance, an animal sacrifice or bringing you know, um, an animal and then slaying it before the Lord, how that pays for anything. How does Jesus dying on the cross pay for something? But it does. And this is, uh, it, it happens in a way that is, is obviously complex and, and we not, may not necessarily understand how this is done, why, why this is done. But think about the technology that someone must have to make a universe and everything in it, including this, this body, this mind that is speaking to you now. If you have that kind of technology and power to bring that into being, if you are saying here that the death of a man on the cross and his suffering and his stripes and his being whipped and bruised acts as a method to escape the common condemnation, which is what a lot of Christians have trouble with, that there's a common condemnation that we're all pouring down into hell for our sin. And the devil is waiting because that's his, that's his due. And the only way out of it is being offered by God through Jesus Christ on the cross. And here it is right here. This is the information that you need to escape that common condemnation. It's not just for a few bad people. Everyone is pouring down to there. That's the biggest secret. You know, David Icke writes his book about the reptilians and it's quite revealing. As far as I understand, I need to get to it and read it but I know a lot of the information in it. But he, he as, as much as that is a fascinating revelation that we get eaten by reptilians, which is confirmed by several other atheists, Alex Collier and Peggy Kane, but we know from it, we know about it from the scripture, but I didn't even have an idea of it literally until I heard about it from these secular folks, David Icke, 
Peggy Kane is the one who really spelled it out for me. You know, that, that's the real thing. She says they're eating people, but it's not just the it's not just being eaten alive. That's that's actually nothing. Okay, I mean, I'm not saying it's nothing, but compared to ending up in hell, where they feed off of your torment, apparently. Well, this is, horrible as that sounds, the common fate of those who dwell on the earth. And there's only one way out of it. There is no room for error in this realization, and this conclusion from God's word. As horrible as that sounds, like how come you don't see that in the news? Well, uh, today on the news, uh, we know there's a lot of other problems you're facing, but once again, we want to remind you that the main problem you face is ending up in hell when you die, which you don't want, because it turns out that the pain that we feel is like numbness compared to the pain that you feel there. Your senses are opened up. You see more colors. You can realize things much quicker. People report saying they knew everything. Again and again, they say, you just, you just know everything. You know all the people that were there. You know all the things that were happening. You were aware of all this stuff just suddenly simultaneously in your mind because your mind, you, the, the, the powers of your mind are freed from the confines of our current body. That which you don't want, that which you would want for yourself and for your family is salvation. And there's only one way that you're going to get it. And here it is right here, Isaiah 53, 10. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. This is telling us that, that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, these stripes, this death on the cross, this story of a man dying on a cross, though he had done no sin, he had done no wrong. All he did was go around and heal the people and preach the truth. But they killed him. They whipped him, beat him, scourged him till he was bloody and blue and he couldn't even hardly walk. And somebody else had to carry the cross. They had to hire another Jew just to carry the cross behind him because he was too beaten down and, and, and bloody and weak. But he hadn't sinned. But this was done. So that we hearing about it now, we, we in this time, can hear it, and, and all the time that since then, that, that he had passed on from then, and, and, the, and the gospel was preached to the world. Anyone who had read this, who had heard it, and just decided in their heart, well, this is, what, this is what God is offering. This is the story. This is the out from the common condemnation of man, from the problem of dying. If, you don't, if you're not afraid of hell, you don't believe in hell, it's, you know, it's, I understand it. That subject really angered me when I heard it. Think about the problem of death, because this is saying that if you will take hold of him, take hold of his work on the cross, take hold of his soul and offering for sin, his reward very clearly, the Bible is a legal document, and it is saying that if you succeed, if you are honorable in this covenant of his soul is an offering for sin, you will get a life free of pain, free of sorrow and crying, and free from the threat and the inevitable problem of death. Now, tell me, what is all that you can have in the world compared to that? Think about this eternal life, free of the threat or problem of death, and no more sorrow, no more even crying. See, you like crying, it's great when you see people in movies going, <laughs> well, guess what? There's none of that if you receive this, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, Jesus Christ on the cross. This is the story, this is the offering, this is it, just Look at that story that God has offered through his words, which are pure. Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord, no one else's, no one else's edits. Constantine didn't come in somehow outside of God's will and edit this or that, and it was his bad decisions, blah, 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 and that's why the book of Enoch isn't in there, blah, 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 and the book of Thomas and all these other great scriptures, and, and it's a shame and we don't know that stuff because it was out of God's control. No. 
The words of the Lord are pure, meaning no one else took anything out that God didn't intend, and no one put anything in, not a space, not a period, nothing. In God's pure word, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, that his people, the Jews, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The phrases coming after, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, are jumping 2,000 years into the future, now, when the people will begin to be redeemed, starting, as I said, with Jerusalem and Babylon. Jumping 2,000 years ahead, he, God's only begotten Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ from Nazareth, was the Lamb, will be the Lion. When he shall see his people coming up, this is happening, this will happen in our lifetimes. If you're, well, I'm 50, so if, if, uh, if you're not 80, uh, chances are you'll see it. So this is coming, and it's either going to happen or not. This is coming in the earth. And a lot of people who don't believe this, don't know it, don't follow it, don't bother to read God's word, God who created them and created this planet and everything on it, and uh, people like, you know, Kerry Cassidy and David Wilcock and all these uh, atheists that don't look carefully at what God's word is saying, but they believe in ascension. You're going you're gonna to ascend to the fifth level of vibration, and, uh, and, and you're going to, you know, this, this higher state of consciousness is going to be, you know, so wonderful and great, but you're not looking carefully at God who created this whole situation to see what the real ascension is. The real ascension is not ascension. It's, a, it's ascension of a type. But it's salvation in the Lord, in Jesus Christ. And everyone who says, well, I can come through it some other way, some other, I can, I can by, by being loving and peaceful and loving my fellow man and, and being a, you know, as decent a person as I can possibly be and doing nothing but altruistic works and revealing the truth about the evil and, and trying to make the world a better place, I can do it that way. But you shall, the same as the tobacco salesman, fall down into hell, the common condemnation, because there is absolutely, positively no room for error in what is in God's word, God's holy and pure word, telling us that this, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, is the only way, it is the way that God has offered freely to all men to make the choice. It's up to you to choose. Are you going to see this and say, okay, God who, who created me, I mean, I... I don't know you, I haven't seen you, I, I don't get it, but, but here it is. I mean, this is, this is God's pure word saying to us, this is it. This is the salvation. This is the way that I have offered. The death of my only begotten son on the cross. This is what I'm offering, if you want. To know who I am, who created you, and to receive this, it's right here in my word, that's perfect. It's undeniable. It is a situation where it is either true or it isn't. Because you're going to walk up to Jesus Christ and say, Well, I saw some other people that you had led into your kingdom and they, they didn't get eternal life. What's going on here? Can't be. No one can have something in here that was a prophecy that didn't come true. That can't happen because God, who says, Behold, his dwelling place is going to be among us, here in the, in the earth, as a man, as a man and a woman, he is saying that this is where the reward is. This is where the final result of all that he has done is going to be. So, if you're thinking that you're going to ascend into some other dimension or someplace else, or you think something's going to happen to you, other than either going down or going up, you've got the wrong idea, friends. Don't be fooled. This is it. 
This is the real story. The devil is laughing at those people. He knows they all belong to him. They know that all these people in the New Age movement, Corey Good, David Wilcock, uh, Kerry Cassidy, David Icke, uh, all these people, Alex Collier, Peggy Kane, if they don't decide to take God up on his offer of when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, they're falling down, and Satan knows it, and he's laughing. He doesn't bother to disrupt these people too much. He'll fight against them a little because he doesn't want them people to know about stuff like his children that eat human flesh and a whole bunch of other stuff, the you know, secret space program, which is so terrible and wicked and, and uses human slavery and everything else and, you know, trying to, you know, maybe shore up a few leaks about it. But he's not going to fight against them. You want to see Satan fighting against you, start preaching his word and talking about this, talking about the only salvation that is being offered among men, whereby men might be saved from death and may go to some place that doesn't suck as it does now with all kinds of disease and pain and war and calamity. Because people, when their lives are okay, they don't, they don't want to look to something better. They don't want to look to something, to some kind of great answer to it all. They're content. They're content to go about their own pleasures. I know. I have personal experience with it. It's only when you're in pain, it's only when you're in danger, it's only when you suddenly realize that, that everything is not peaceful, that, that there's a lot of darkness and loss of hope and people going nuts and, and food running out and people killing each other and you're in the midst of all that and then you might start to think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's got to be a, a better answer to it all. There's got to be a reason for this and there is. Because God has created this whole situation. He says, behold, I create the good and the evil. But he created the evil for a reason. And we may not know what all those reasons are. But what we do know through the scripture is that he has made a one way, a only way offering from the creator to the creation, to us. If you want to be with him, if you want to know him, if you want to go the right way, got to set aside my own silly, selfish thoughts about what's right and about what I want to do. Just put that aside because I know my thoughts are, are different. They conflict with what God's Word is saying here. I read a lot of this stuff and I go, oh man, it's like it's not, it's not me. I, 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 don't, I don't feel like this is me. But I, through the faith that was given to me, because I heard the story, I read a pamphlet when I was homeless, and I saw on it, it says, say a prayer of Jesus Christ asking to be saved. And growing up in a modern, educated, secular home, I didn't think much of this. And my parents always taught me that, you know, religion was, you know, especially Christianity was just something that people used to feel comfortable with themselves, to, to find some kind of answer. So I didn't think much of it when I saw that. But in the desperation of homelessness, because no matter what I, I seemed to do, I had the curse. And I, I believe now these are curses. You, you can read a lot about that. People have generational curses. And I think the, the curse that my father also had before he died was that uh, was a financial curse. Like nothing you do seems to work. It just seems to fall like sand out of your hand. Relationships fall apart and you just find yourself destitute. Well, that's what happened to me. And in that desperation, I decided, well, here's this. I, I kept getting these pamphlets on my car and I kept throwing them away. And finally, I took one and I said, all right, I've tried everything else. Why don't I just try this prayer to God? And when I did that, my witness to you is God gave me a gift to understand that these words in the authorized King James Bible are perfect and they are pure, but I didn't realize right away that they're pure. It took me a while to find it because I had doubts. You know, oh, I heard a story about Constantine, took out a bunch of books, and then, you know, Satan may have gotten in and, you know, got rid of some of this key stuff. And blah, but I didn't, I didn't read carefully. It took me a while. So I can, if, if you can learn anything from, from my journey and you, you're starting down this yourself, Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. This means we can't come up to Jesus later and say, well, you know, I know your word said that, but, you know, unfortunately, Satan got in or, 
you know, uh, Paul, uh, you know, got rid of some books and, you know, he kind of, we know kinda, he had some strong opinions, you know, and they weren't necessarily, uh, you can't say that. You can't say that. You can't, that, that would, you, the reason I'm saying you can't say that is because that would be a disgrace before the Lord. That would be a disgrace to him. You say, you know, what is Jesus going to say at that point? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry about that. You know, I couldn't get a pure word to you because some other people sinned. God's word is pure. It's perfect. It's like nothing else. It took me a while to realize that. You can save time by realizing it now. Look at it. Realize. Even though it's our hearts are not aligned with it, but that's because we are filled with wickedness, which I recently learned. It was very hard to accept. But Romans 7.18, Paul acknowledges this, one of the greatest Christians that we read of in, in the Scripture. This great man, and he was able to tell us this important information about how what's in our bodies, even living, intelligent, separate persons, as Derek Prince put it, without bodies, influence us. And those that kind of influence, if it's untamed by God's sobering word, which is not our spirit, it's his spirit. If we're not tamed by that, if we're not, if, if that wicked spirit that normally dwells and flourishes in us isn't tapped down. It takes us over and we become addicted to the evil that we think we love, but in fact, it was the persons dwelling inside of us.